Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Safety Meeting Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Heckert. This week's very special guest, Mr. Ross Anderson, joins us all the way from the UK, Wales specifically. Um, we did a little uh, Zoom call. So what you're about to see or hear is um, Zoom footage. Um, I'll probably lay the, the good audio from the roadcaster over the Zoom audio, but it, so far it's been a tie-up when we've been doing this for other shows. Um, we had a great chat. I met Ross on set of uh, music videos years ago. Uh, he's a music video commissioner, was a music video commissioner, then he owned his own production company, and then he's gone off to do some other adventures. Um, so if you're interested in music video directing, tune in. Uh, we get to that early on, first half is music video stuff. So some great insight from a former commissioner on like how to get music video directing jobs, uh, some hangups, some things that are good and bad about being a music video director, um, what it's like being on set, that kind of stuff. Uh, then we kind of take a turn and do some personal stuff, catch up. Uh, we get into religion at the end, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, it's interesting to see how people's views and beliefs change as their life progresses. Um, and people, they have families and they grow. And um, it was a really great chat. It was so good to see his face and uh, catch up with him. And uh, I had a really great time talking to him. So I hope you uh, enjoy this episode, episode 54 of the Safety Meeting Podcast with a uh, very special guest, Ross Anderson. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. How you did, Lynn? I'm good, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to see your face. Yeah, this is the, uh, this is the studio. I like it. It's, wow, that's great. And did you build it yourself out of wood? Um, all the little fixtures on the wall were built in my wood shop about a year ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then the wood paneling is just uh cheap flooring from home Depot that should go on the floor, but I put it on the wall. Yeah. I like that. Well, reclaimed works really well. Actual reclaimed wood is about 20 bucks a square foot. And this is 99 cents a square foot. So we, uh, always thrifty. That's right. For now until, <laughs> Which is, until yeah. we get that Ross Anderson money in here and then we're going to do it upright. Oh uh, yeah. 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 How my teeth? They're great. They, yeah, nice and straight. Like LA enough. Yeah, not they're, really. They're a bit yellow compared to yours, even you. Well, anyway. my webcam is like nine hundred years old, so I'm trying to light for this webcam. What I normally do is I'll shoot it on a better camera, so I look great, and then I'll just <laughs> <laughs> screen grab the guest. But uh, I did a zoom last week, and it worked out great. What are you drinking? Hmm white wine i'm three glasses down so you'll be uh you'll be getting the uncensored <laughs> floppy version but i thought well you know why not just keep to the same old uh sort of you know as we normally do right professionally and uh in in unprofessional situations of which we've been in many yeah we um uh, wherever we go when the work is done we like to drink yes quite yeah i wasn't alluding to the fact we were drunk on set because that would be uh, illegal never 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 Except that one time that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. uh, so how's things? Uh, things are going uh, weird. You know, we're in the middle of a lockdown, but I still get to come here we? by myself. Are you guys locked down? Yes, we are. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, some states have decided that that's just bullshit and they're just going to do whatever they want. Um, we've been wa we've been watching with we, we as I, I can talk now. Is it, am I your first uh, guest from the UK? Yes. Brilliant. So I can talk for the whole of the UK. That's fantastic. I'm Please. sure they won't mind. Yeah, I have two uh, listeners the, um, in Spain, but I have no idea who they are, unless you have a VPN, yeah, well, that, which is not which is not part of the UK. So so uh, same <laughs> same thing. But the uh, uh, yeah, so I'm I'm on the white wine. Cheers. Cheers. To We're on the coffee. Yeah, the uh, decaffeinated coffee per the doctor's order. Right. Um, uh, did you? Um, why? Why oh, is it doctor's orders? Because apparently I, I've been having sleeping problems for the last 100 years. Um, and the doctor said my high blood pressure was because I was consuming 700 milligrams of uh, caffeine every day. Cocaine. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, apparently I was doing the Michael Jackson where I'd caffeinate all day. And then to get off the caffeine buzz, I would uh, drink alcohol and smoke weed to bring me back to sleep. And then I wasn't getting good sleep. So uh, I'm on the decaf for about a month now. And, for you. Uh, I feel great. I had, I had a similar conversation, but I went to a Chinese acupuncturist who said um, in Chinese, and it was through a translator, that you should stop drinking coffee and uh, generally sort your life out, but um, uh, eat something warm in the morning. Yeah. And uh, I, um, which I did. And I got these 
banging headaches yeah. for like two weeks, which was just unbelievable. And then uh, and I thought, well, why would I ever drink coffee again? And I haven't drunk coffee again for well, was 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever have? Because I was like, I would like the smell of it, but I don't miss it. Yeah. You know, I, uh... um, I'm still on the crack and the, and the rest of it, you know, but the, uh, <laughs> it's, I got rid of the coffee. <laughs> still mainlining everything else. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's funny. Um, so where am I, what, which one of your states am I talking to you from today? States. Uh, well, the state of Wales. Right. Um, a, a, a and, states. Uh, like you have, you guys don't have houses either. You have a state like with an E. Oh, estate, estates. Yeah. I thought you meant the states as in, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm in, um, I'm in Wales, in our house in Wales, halfway from mountain. Right. Uh, I can't show you now because it's dark, but the, um, we live in a place called the Black Mountains, which um, is, uh, uh well there's a lot of weather let's put it that way rain particularly. Um, but um but it's great for lockdown we, when we got here we thought is this a really good idea and then and didn't think it was a very good idea because we're in the middle of nowhere and then uh we realized when lockdown came that actually it's not a bad place to be We've got some space yeah. there's not loads of people yeah. um but um and we've got some space just to hang out really which is not to be honest we've been on lockdown since like like three years ago so oh this is not a major difference apart from the fact we have to queue up a, a yeah. shop you know you guys pro- practically locked down like the day i left london i think yeah right yeah 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 because we we just shot the last we were one of the last people to shoot i think in we shot a thing for red bull in london and uh everybody was like social distancing and washing their hands and but nobody had masks on, you know, yeah. but it was sort of a, it was almost like a sort of vision of the future of filmmaking because everybody was like keeping their distance. And, you know, it was just, it was quite, it was quite nice. And as far as I'm aware, nobody got ill. So, you know, um, I, don't, I mean, I haven't done a proper check, but you know what I mean? Like it, it I haven't gone through the whole cast list and crew list, but right. the, it was, you know, it was sort of felt like, you know, the way that it will go, nobody shaking hands, nobody, spitting or coughing on each other you know right like we normally do (laughs) we normally do yeah i mean spitting and coughing on each other yeah do you are you (laughs) on part of any kind of producers council or anything that uh would help guide the the governance of what's going to be happening on set are you involved in any of that stuff like yeah we have a thing called the apa which is the advertising producers association which look after music video kindly as well um and uh and they've been really great they've been lobbying the government for you know some sort of idea of how things work moving forward you know how what the rules will be and when when we can start work again Mm -hmm. um i think there's some sort of premise that you can sort of shoot under some certain guidelines but i'm not quite sure anybody is someone asked me to um i won't name names but someone asked me to make this was like three weeks ago someone said oh can you make a, a music could you go and make a music a gorilla music video for five grand by the way which obviously <laughs> the answer is fuck off right. but the uh the you know not what can you make on five grand but the um uh the um and i said well you know no not really but but you know they, they just were really relentless about it and they were like yeah but you could do this and we could shoot this and we could do that and I was like, look, you know, we're going to be the only guys out there filming, like, yeah. you know, and they yeah. wanted to do us on an estate where everybody's in lockdown, as in not a posh estate, like a council estate, like a sort of, you know, like oh. a sort of project type vibe. Yeah. Right? And and this guy that was the artist was not from the estate, from the from the from the place. So it was like, right, so we're going to be a film crew in a place where no one knows who we are. They don't know who he is. We're right. just going to be like having things thrown at us right and then also people are going to be filming us showing other people and effectively the whole uh uk film industry that we're out there filmmaking when we're not supposed to be and passing on disease and everything else so right. so i politely declined right speaking of um, polite, that, yeah um are, is nice and polite still a thing no, we sold it uh, back in 2016. So we started it in 2011. I left Universal, then we went to, uh, then I started Nice and Polite. Um, and uh, we took it to IPO in 2016, which was great for about 10 minutes. When I was a millionaire <laughs> Yeah. for about 10 minutes. Uh, and then uh, um, multi-millionaire. And then, and, uh, yeah, literally it just all fell apart. But, the, but, you know, so back to the grindstone and normal life and basically, yeah. It's a good thing because I probably would have killed myself. 
Well, don't do that. Um, but we're probably going to get deep into music videos here in a second. But let's um, backtrack to your Universal days so people can kind of know how you mm. started um, and why you're an authority, uh, why we're both authorities. <laughs> both of us. Absolutely. Um, Isaac. So I mean, what, I, I, yeah. Is it accurate to say that you were the um, international czar of music videos for a short term? Or a long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would modestly say that's the case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, international, universal. Yeah, pro, I mean, I, you know, right. no, I, I, we were, you know, we were making music videos in the UK, and and we were making quite a lot of them in, as you know, in LA, uh, in the US, and um, and it was going really well. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, not that it stopped going really well; it just continued. But I just didn't continue being at Universal. But yeah, it was. Um, for a little while there, we were, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, we were making a lot of music videos. Yeah. What, can you explain for the, uh, two or three people watching at home, what a music video commissioner is and does? <laughs> Not really. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I, can I explain? It depends on who you are. I think I realized when I left music video commissioning that music video commissioners live in a certain bubble and each of them are very different and having yeah. then dealt with them as a, as a sort of supplier effectively, um, that, um, it, it, you know, they're not necessarily, it, each has their own personality, each has their own approach. Um, mine was really, uh, so I can only speak for myself. Mine was to find out what an artist needs and uh, really listen to the music and find out what would be the best way of expressing that visually. Mm -hmm. um, and then going out to the very talented world of music video directors and creative people um, to find the best person or people to do that. Um, you're a, you know, I, I always thought I was on my gravestone, it would be, you know, the best middleman ever. And, uh, <laughs> and, and what a great, what a great legacy. Yeah. Um, but the, um, uh, but that effectively is the job, you know, you're sort of, you're between the label and um, the world of production and the world of creative loveliness. And your job is to uh, oversee the project until it, until it finishes from both from a creative perspective and from a uh, production budget, you know, um, perspective. So you're managing the project. What were you doing with your life before? Were you working at Universal and you worked your way up to be the commissioner or were you doing yeah, something else? I, I, I started life at, um, in my professional career as uh, I worked for a guy called Tony Wilson very briefly who used to run a thing called Factory Records, which was New Order and um, Happy Mondays and bands like that, which were at the time, you know, the, the the biggest bands in the world in our world anyway and um uh and he ran a a, a music uh conference called in the city and i went to work for that it was fresh out of university and um there was it was just such an amazing sort of insight into the world of the music business at that time this is like sort of early 2000s and uh you know everybody got paid in cocaine Red Bull had just been like, you know, uh, launched. So everybody was drinking Red Bull. I don't think I slept for three days <laughs> and it was insane. And that was the sort of, you know, uh, that was the sort of, you know, yeah, that, that was the introduction to the music industry, which by the way, it turned out to be nothing like that at all. But the, but it was, um, <laughs> uh, I then got a job at a local uh, um, independent uh, label and um, moved down, I was in Manchester and moved down to London and um, worked in a wine shop for a while, which was great. And then uh, got a job at Polydor Records and started as the PA to the guy, which was hilarious by the way, because I'm a rubbish PA, um, but the, uh, <laughs> and it was got fired at least five times. But the, um, he, uh, the guy who now runs it, he's now a guy called David Joseph, who now runs Universal Europe, as far as I'm aware, or UK. and. Um, I um he's he must have seen something in 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 me and put me into the or just hated me and put me <laughs> into the video department and uh uh with my longtime friend and mentor Cynthia Lowell, who um is you know, she did videos for like Portishead and the Rolling Stones and uh wow, I mean David Bowie and you know, like she was like the the woman who did that. So I worked with her and then, um, yeah. And then, and then started to make some music videos, you know, as well, create, well, commission some music videos. Sorry. I, I use the word make, um, loosely. Is it fair I to say that make. when, uh, like a, just a broad stroke, 
definition of being a commissioner uh, among the thousands of other things that you're responsible for, like the budget and whatnot, but uh, is just a Cliff Notes version. You're directing the directors, right? You're keeping an eye on them. Well, yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's, it depends on the director. You know, some people need more sort of guidance than others. I think by the time that I finished my role at Universal, I think we were writing a lot of the briefs because we were quite specific about what we wanted. You know, uh, quite prescriptive about the creative and everything else. But I think that, you know, it depends because we met some directors like Sam Faramand and, you know, um, Chris Cunningham, like people who were like, you know, you don't direct those guys. They right. just, you just ask them very kindly if they'll do something for you and they they decide whether they want to or not, right? So, and, and you know, so um, sometimes, you know, but sometimes people, you know, they need to know what you need and, and yeah, it, it depends, you know uh it's really that role between getting the creative right getting getting actually what you've been promised i think a lot of the time you know yeah finding out what it is because a lot of it is adjectives that don't really mean anything and a lot of a lot of it is it's going to be great you know it doesn't really you know you're like well i'm sure it is but what is it um but the uh the you know and that comes with um it's like an i suppose it's like a creative producer you're sitting in between the sort of creative and the and the logistics to be able to make sure that what you're getting from a client perspective is is what you've paid for but also that it's the best it can be you know um and pushing where you need to push and understanding where you need to be quiet you know because i think that as we both know every single production is it just a myriad of variables right yeah and and you know if you go in sort of demanding that because it's rained you want sunshine then then you're just an idiot shouting in a, <laughs> in, a in a forest where no one can hear you right <laughs> wow that wine's really paying off we're getting metaphorical <laughs> well you know you're a poet when absolutely. you absolutely do you ever write this down when you're drinking you ever just write down your metaphors uh, I mean, I, 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 I do, but it's all scrawly and I can't read it in the next day. You know? Right. I do that with my joke book too. I'm a genius. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is going to make everybody laugh. I'm just going to write this down real quick. And then I look yeah, at the next two day. words like sheep and, yeah, and yeah. refrigerator. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay. And then I try to take that on stage. I'm like, sheep, refrigerator. And then nothing, yeah, nothing happens. Pause. But um, I've found that it's a lot of fun to sit in that awkward silence where some people would start to curl inside themselves i i love it when there's like this when i'm bombing and, do you and i god yeah i mean that's that's the strength isn't it of stand up that is the that's the holy grail is that you create that pause and then you wait it out and then people just get so awkward they start laughing anyway right? exactly and i have <laughs> 13 years of doing that in front of uh you know musical artists and movie celebrities and tv show people and you know Trying to get a joke or a yeah. laugh out of the rock is a completely different thing than trying to get a, a laugh out of an audience that doesn't know who you are. Um, yeah. But it, it, I figured out that if I'm not having fun, it doesn't matter if the jokes are funny. So whether or not I'm funny to the crowd, if I got up there and had a good time and I made myself laugh, at least in, on the inside, then that's all that matters. That's what I'm shooting for. Well, absolutely. I was thinking about you earlier. Um, because we were doing this, but also because I think about you a lot, but also, oh, you know, the, the idea of a first AD and what you did and do and, and, and the, I was thinking about, you know, from coming from the UK and that I would come to LA and it would be as exciting as it would be. It would also be really stressful. And because you don't, cause there's so many unknowns. And I think that the reason, the reason that I, you know, would constantly ask if you could be on set as a first AD would be because if, I knew you were there, then it would take away a lot of the variables. At least I could, we could have an honest conversation about the fact that is this going to go fucking south or is it going to, is it going to go left or right? Right. And, the, and the, you know, and uh, not that you would ever, you know, you, it wasn't that you were my man on the inside because right. you would tell me quite, quite emphatically to fuck off. Yeah. But the, you know, it was always that the, um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was important that, you know, you've just got that person who's like telling the truth. Right. Because there's, there's such an element on set, especially in music videos, where even if the ship has completely sunk and all of the wheels have fallen off and any other metaphor you want to use, everybody's still yeah. like, this is really great, you guys. We're definitely yeah, yeah. doing it. And you're like, well, some of us are doing it and some of us are learning. So 
That's well, well, and that's and actually, yeah, you asked that question of what a commissioner does, right? And that and that and there's there's lots of different elements to it, whether you're a good one or a bad one. But realistically, every single shoot, and I'm sure you'd agree that people do, at the end of the day, everybody hugs each other, which I had a great there was a guy a director called Daniel Wolf, right? Who at the end of the he's a he's a Mancunian, quite a hardcore old guy. He's fantastically successful now. But I remember him at the end of a shoot going, Why the fuck is everybody hugging each other? Like they don't do that in a fucking bank. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, at the end of the day, not everybody goes around fucking hugging each other, telling right. each other they're amazing. Exactly. And the, and this sort of, and this idea of, you know, the, the end of the day, yeah, it might have been a great day and everybody feels like they've got it. But I'll tell you what, that changes as soon as you get to the edit and they're all sat in the edit going, well, why haven't we got the close up? Why haven't we got the big, right. you know, and, and that's then on me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and no, it's not on anybody who's been there on the day who can go on to the next job. It's on the people who just didn't ask the right questions. And they might on the day have been a really awkward question to ask. Yep. But, the, you know, it's, um, you don't want, you know, it's confrontation isn't very nice. But at the same time, you just, you, if you don't get what you need to get on that day, and you've spent all of the money on that day, you know, either you have to pay a load more money to go and get it again, which is inevitably a nightmare, or um, or the video just gets binned, and yeah. and you know that that is always my to this day is always shocking to me when things like you know music videos which might cost ten thousand pounds or a hundred thousand pounds or two thousand pounds, mm -hmm. however much they cost, that amount of money is a lot of money, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And 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 how could you just put it in the bin? Yeah, that was one of my biggest challenges. Um... It went, went, either a first time director or like a visionary director that's been doing it for 20 years. Uh, if we'd be on the wide of a performance and we've on our 30th take, but we haven't gone in and gotten any coverage. Oh, we're mixing beers and wines. That's awesome. Well, uh, I've, I've finished the wine and now I thought beer <laughs> might be more sensible because if I continue on the wine, it's going to end in tears. Oh, keep going with the wine. Uh, I'll get back on the wine. There you go. Uh, my biggest problem would always be trying to convince this director, whether they're a first time director or, you know, somebody that's been doing it forever. Like at the end of the day, 28 takes of the wide isn't going to make you a cut. Like we yeah. have to start getting in there and getting our coverage. You have it. It's somewhere in the, between those 28 takes, you've got your wide and yeah. you're going to hang on it for the intro and you're going to might cut to it on the outro for just a second. Plus you're going to pop in all your narrative. We got to move on. And it's, well, and, and an interesting thing about wides, I think, is that you're only ever going to see in a music video, you're only going to ever see like four wides. Mm -hmm. So, so just shoot four wides. Right. Do you know what I mean? And also in a wide, you can do what the fuck you want. It doesn't have to be, you know, like you can exactly. sort of get it generally. So the, you know, and the, and, and I think that there's sort of, especially a sort of, you know, an inexperienced or particularly arrogant director will, will be pushing to be like, no, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. It's like, well, there's a timeline, right? Yep. There's a there's an amount of time we can get stuff done, and if you haven't got it right, that's on you. But we need to move on, you know. Yep. And that I suppose that's when a commissioner, and the reason why I suppose we're friends as well, and that become friends is because a commissioner, I suppose, would understand the need to get on with it. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Like, yep. there's not, it's not just, you know, it's not, we're not going to be here for like three days unless you're um, a specific director, a director called Wiz, who works here in the UK, who's a brilliant director, but and I and I shot I think for forty eight hours straight with him, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have no idea how he got away with that. I don't know, you know, he must have something on the producer or something. But I, I <laughs> you know, aside from him, yeah, uh, the uh, you know, there, yeah, there is a certain amount of time, and and actually, you know, on that point as well, uh, which can bang on about for ages. But the I went to a festival of people who make music videos and stuff, and. Normally they're, you know, they're just they're what they are. But the what was really interesting was hearing from an editor, you know, an editor saying, why don't, you know, what we would love is if the director came and talked to us before they shot. Yeah. Because then we can go through the shot list. We can go through what we've planned and we can tell you what we need. And, and then, you know, and we can tell you what to prioritise because that's what we need, right? To make that three and a half minute, whatever it is, um, narrative or... Uh, structure work and I thought that was like that, for me that was like game changing yeah that was like yeah why doesn't everybody do that right so when we're you know when I when I'm in production now it's always uh, I always try and say that to our directors you know can you can you just have a quick chat with the editors go through it and, and it, you know they're always like well why would we do that you know but you're like well because you, you don't have to take the advice they give you but I would recommend you you at least listen to what they have to say right Exactly. And I've always said some, some of my favorite directors that I get along with the best, uh, I've been saying this for years, editors make the best directors. Yeah. Because they don't overshoot. 
It's like, uh, I got mm. that. And oh, I only need a little bit of this. And then when you're into the narrative, they're like, well, I don't, don't need him to walk all the way from the kitchen. He just needs to go around the corner. And then yeah, exactly. they shoot and it. Basis, in. And by the way, bassists make the best editors, in my opinion. Because <laughs> well, they, they know the beat. I happen to be a bass player, and I happen to also be no. an editor. The only thing I wasn't successful at in my film career was directing. <laughs> Except, it's well, funny that you bring up $5,000 music videos, because my last music video had a $5,000 budget, and it's currently over 300-something million views. Well, for fuck's sake. And this is the problem. <laughs> Uh, well, congratulations, but also, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, because I've run a company since. I think, I think that I was thinking about this as well earlier about, you know, yeah, of course, I mean, people can make music videos on, on much less now because the technology is such that you can, you know, you don't need all that you used to need, and, and right. that I don't want to sound like a just some moany old guy saying like, you know, you can't, you can't do stuff. I, great ideas are great ideas, and if you can realise them, then fantastic. It doesn't really matter how much they cost. But I think the the business of music video, um, you know, that 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 then changes the business because the business, you know, can't re- it, unless it's made. Wait, how many how many videos would it have to make? How many five grand videos would it have to make a day to get through the, the idea that you'd have to employ people, develop talent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, right. so actually, the the way that the whole business changes adapts you know it's not that it won't adapt it's not that it won't change it's not that it isn't and it not, it's not that it hasn't you know but i think that um it's about sustainability and i think it's about record labels and artists understanding um their supply chain mm-hmm. because it's such an important part of the visual of an artist is 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 hugely important and yeah. if you get it if you make a bad video for an artist they have to live with that forever yeah, and 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 the, you know, so it really is about sort of this idea of yeah, we can make things cheaper, but it's really about you know, if you try to switch that into the investment into the artist, and 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 that that sort of mindset of what, what, what are we investing in the artist properly? You know, that's a sort of it's a it's a really interesting sort of dynamic, I think, in terms of how things have changed and how things you know need to need to sort of how we need to understand things. You know, Do you find that the way that the labels are selecting their artists has changed? Like it used to be like development. We can see the talent. We're going to work with them. We're going to help them grow. And now it just seems like, oh, this kid's got 4 million followers on Instagram. Let's scoop them up. Or this kid won American Idol. Or like, do you feel like the way that labels are selecting their talent is different now? Yeah, I mean, I can't. I don't know. You know, I, I haven't got an insight into the U.S. market as much. But I, I know that the U.K. market usually does things probably just before the US market does in a certain way. I think the internet's changed that, but I think the, yeah, I mean, there's real positives around, you know, signing an artist that's got X, X million hits on, on YouTube or, or Spotify or whatever, because you're going with a winner. I mean, that's just, that's just good betting, right? You know, it's, it's, you, you're more likely to win, uh, you, you're on this, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna win a gamble if you bet on a horse that's won ten races as opposed to one that's not won any. But the, as in, you know, in terms of that makes total sense. And if you, you know, but I think the the magic of music and the and the sort of the artistic bit of A and R, I suppose, is finding that person who just didn't have the chance to get there because they didn't know how to get there. So they didn't know how to get four million hits. I think those things, those people are sort of they're less unicorn than they used to be, those sort of Justin Bieber characters. But um, there is another side of it, which is that there might be an artist who is, a, is, a, is an okay rapper, but could be great. You know, The yeah. Verve, and then God, I'm showing my age, but The Verve, for example, didn't, didn't really hit until their fourth album, you know, or, you know, these artists that they, they do need a little bit of sort of time in the ring to be able to get good. Right. Do you know what I mean? And that totally. and that that sort of mentality, I think, that maybe is getting lost. You know, right. the, the, you know, and, and always was actually, even you know, 10, 10 years ago or whatever. But the you know, it is give them time and they'll blossom. Mm-hmm. But obviously it's gonna cost you a bit of money before they do blossom. But when they do blossom, they're gonna blossom so hard that then you're gonna make even more money than you would have ever thought you're going to make off that first album. I've seen a lot of artists go by the wayside who, you know, just didn't have time, just didn't enough time in the game, really. Right. And there's a, I think there's a lot of parallels to that in uh, the comedy world also. Like, 
yeah you can tell if somebody you know is inherently funny in a chat uh but that doesn't mean that that's going to translate to the stage and then it's going to take years of reps on the stage to yeah see if they can work that material out and just yeah. being situationally funny doesn't necessarily cut it so some of these people that are great singer performers on youtube in their bedroom get in front of an audience and they completely freeze up they don't necessarily have the stage presence so there's yeah. also there's just a lot of factors going into it and it's a i think it's an interesting time for for music and uh the way we promote music um is it's it's less about the big machine now and more about like what can you pull off from your apartment or your house yeah i think it's the age of the independent artist I think that the you know the and and almost the age of probably the independent comedian in, in in a sense as well you know I think that you're right I think there's a there's you know there's a historic sort of route to market which you have to you know you have to learn a game but also the you know the I think that you now you know what does you've got to ask what a label offers you know and and you know what's the label offer well you've got distribution because you can do it through TuneCore or lander or whatever whichever one you choose and you can get real time you know transparent like um stats on what you're doing and which countries you're working in and what date you know if you do a little bit of marketing on facebook then you know you can work out whether that works or not you know or whether it works better on instagram or what but you know or you, or you focus it on whatever so so i think i think that the independent artists now all of that stuff that the record label used to hide behind this sort of shroud of this is what we do is gone, you know, because no one's buying physical products anymore. So I think that the is not need, you know, that distribution network is completely collapsed. So I think I think realistically, um, labels probably have to ask them, have to ask themselves what what we're offering, you know, and um, and the independent artist actually can rise up and say, well, you know. There's a great, there's a great example actually. A guy called Bugsy Malone, a rapper in uh, in Manchester, who killing it, done it all himself, as far as I can tell, and it's just a great, it's, it's just a great story. Do you know what I mean? And there's so many others, and I, I just think that, you know, it's taken away that idea that labels have this power, um, and uh, I love that. Yeah, I love it too. It's awesome. Um... It's great, man. So after leaving um, Universal, you do you want to talk about Nice and Play? Do you want to skip over to what you're doing now? Well, Nice and Play is done. So yeah, I mean, you know, what I'm doing now. I suppose what 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 I realised with Nice and Play is that um, you know very quickly I went to Berlin with uh, s some of my friends who were directors called Alex and Jan, and we went and got really stoned and we got this chalkboard and we wrote what would a new production company look like and. Uh, and we wrote loads of things down and a bit like the conversation we had earlier, we just didn't remember anything when we woke up in the morning, but all of it was brilliant. Yeah. And, uh, and, and actually then, you know, we decided not to work together for whatever reason, but the, I went and launched Nice and Polite. It became a very typical production company, you know, roster of directors, great directors. Um, and we made some cool shit, but we won an MTV Music Award. We won uh, Can Lion. We won one show in new york we you know we, we we were we were killing it right but but the but the model didn't really work like there's this sort of idea that a bit like artists like directors you know it was really the, the worst bit i realized actually i sort of asked, I had to ask myself what's the bit that is the bit i don't enjoy and it was talking to directors because <laughs> But well, as in, you know, as in managing them, because realistically that relationship, because the, not because of them, but because the relationship didn't work, mm -hmm. they were asking, what are you doing for me today? Where's the work? Right. And if there was too much work, why have I got too much? You know, it's sort of this weird sort of power balance of you're the man, right? Which I didn't, you know, it was like, well, we're all on the same team. So right. I'm not the man. I'm just, we're just trying to fight for the same, we're trying to fight the same battle. But, right. you know, the... And actually, we had quite a quite a quick turnover of directors because either they, they weren't you know they weren't people didn't really want to work with them or because they were too niche or they were too whatever or that um, you know we would develop them and then they would make something cool and then they would get signed up by the bigger production companies the right. and the whatever and that was frustrating right because you put a lot of effort in and and they're like you know wooed by a bigger label and you're like right they're cool so i just got to the point where i was like actually this isn't working for me anymore this is like annoying me yeah so um 
so I thought, right, you know, once we once we'd sort of gone through the process of nice and polite, um, there was a there was a bit afterwards where I went on holiday for like basically a year, and then had a bit of a nervous breakdown, whatever you know, etc. And then <laughs> there's uh, got to be uh, good midlife, stories midlife, in that. midlife crisis. Yeah, no, that, yeah, it was good. Yeah, that you know, year so has to have being, some nuggets in it. Being in the Grand Prix, giving in the uh, Grand Prix in Singapore, and uh, uh, yeah, it was it was it was fun. Right. But the um, the point was that I just came back and thought, right, you know, who am I? Mm. You know, and actually, what what the, the thing about and just to go back to the universal thing, when I left Universal, I had a huge, you know, when you work for a company like that, you work for a, any sort of, I suppose, corporation. I see it with people now. They've got this sort of armor of, yeah, I'm the guy from Universal, I'm that guy. Mm -hmm. and uh and they've got this sort of you know swagger um when that's taken away when you're not you know the whatever your title is you're just you and then you have to ask yourself who are you right you know you know have you are you just a, a guy who likes the sound of his own voice with a mild alcohol and drug problem like you know in my in my case <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at you, right? or are we all just that that's but why I, we get you know, it's just you know, you just sort of think, well, who am I? And it really hit me quite hard, you know. And and then, um, and it happened again after Nice and Polite, you know, sort of, you know, you'd sold it, don't got a bit of money out of it. And then you get to the sort of top of the mountain and you go, well, what was it that I wanted? You know, mm. what what is it that you need to do? So, so it really sort of crafted the idea of um, what's next. What's next is I want to make creative work. I want to do on my terms i don't want a load of overhead i don't really want to be looking after a load of people that are looking to me to make their lives different because i just don't know how to do that right yeah you know it's, I, don't, I don't feel that, that and i've got children that's my job with them it's not i haven't got you know i don't want you know it's not like fucking noah's ark i don't want like, right loads of you kids. need 12 other kids but, well yeah exactly right yeah. so so um so I, I, I it made a, it made a really clear decision so i'm boring you it made a really clear decision as to uh you know let's not have a roster now at the time that would that felt a little bit like Ooh, that's, that's a bit weird a production company without a roster right um but actually in in effect what it's done is sort of mean that every project that we come across we can put together a bespoke team that's right for the project mm -hmm. so you know you can pick the right illustrator and animator uh, director and and basically put that team together and when you have that conversation do you want to work do you want to do a project that's this, you know, their, their, com their conversation is yes or yes or no. Um, and it's really simple. You get the project done. Yeah, there's probably some variables in between. And then you say goodbye until the next one. Well, you hug at the and, end. You got to hug at the end. And then so. you got to hug at the end, obviously, you know, like <laughs> any normal production. Like at the bank. Um, virtually, yeah. as we are doing now. But, yeah. you know, so, yeah, I mean, I think it feels a lot healthier. And it also feels that the directors that we're working with and the talent that we're working with, you know, they can go and work with whoever they want. They can do whatever they want. They can, you know, they, it's not up to me. You know, they're not they're not looking at me going, well, you signed this contract with us. You know, I feel a little bit bound by it. Yeah. You're like, well, yeah, just go and do whatever you want. I can give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and that's great. You know, yeah. And that feels very modern. It's just project by project and you just bang it out and then on to the next one, which absolutely makes a lot of sense as opposed to having 12, 15, 20 mouths to feed all the time, keeping them working. Yeah. yeah. Getting them and to you, work know, you know, the days. reality of that is that you've always got, you know, you've got your guys who are sort of doing the work and they've got a reputation and they're doing the right stuff, but then you've got your other guys who are maybe in development or just haven't worked for a while and they're pissed off. And, you know, it's just, it just feels, you know, it just feels wrong. Yeah. You know? What? You're hearing my uh, emails coming in. Sorry. No, I'm not hearing them at all. Good, great. Are you um, you hearing anything on my end? I don't know. Just your, just the uh, soulful, uh, deep voice. Well, that's, this is my podcast voice. <laughs> oh, right. Sexy time. Sexy time. Uh, do you have any? Uh, not to take a hard right turn, but do you have any plans on being in the U.S.? That's a stupid question. Are you? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> can't leave your yes, fucking I'm, house. I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna commission a private jet. We can't uh, leave we're gonna, house. we're gonna, can't leave it. we're gonna get ourselves out of. Uh, we're gonna, get, we're gonna fly really low under the radar, right? And your... try and not, you know, just, just not infringe any, uh, you know, uh, airspace rules, and uh, and just the, to come and see you basically. in the private jet, just to come on and and, uh, and hang out, and yeah, just uh, hang out for a bit. But you, from a, you would love it here distance. now. The beaches are closed. 
uh, but my business partner lives on the sand. You know, I'll take him some mail, do whatever, get to hang out. We'll have a coffee, socially distant. But he's got the beach to himself. It's fucking amazing. But I can, you know, that normally take two, three hours to get there normally with traffic. It takes 23 minutes now. Well, it's. I imagine it's what LA would be like if I imagined if I moved to LA. And then when you get to LA, you realize that, you know, normally before this, yeah. that you would be sitting in traffic for six hours and, and go, oh, actually, no, this isn't what I imagined. I imagine yeah. it'd be like a cross between like Baywatch and, um, you know, uh, uh, Knight Rider. Right. That's exactly what I pictured. And then you get here <laughs> and it's more like, um, I don't know, New York in the 80s. Uh, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. Like it was, LA was not what I thought I was signing up for, but I signed up for it with my three best friends. We all moved here together. So it was, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like, well, I'm not giving up. Are you giving up? No. So we kind of all just kind of pushed each other and uh, only one or two of us gave up. But the rest of us. Are you glad you're, are you glad you're not in New York? I mean, that sounds pretty horrific. Uh, New York was never for me. I went there with my uh, senior high school class for New Year's Eve and just one trip around the city. And I was like, I hate it here. So, uh, <laughs> I like to visit. I like to do one or two jobs there a year, but only in the summer. You're not going to catch me there in the winter ever again. Probably never going to catch me in New York City after this thing. Yeah, right. No, not for shit. There's no way I'm ever going there. I was born in upstate New York. So How were you? Yeah. I thought you were born in like Colorado or something. I wish. Uh maybe maybe my kids will be born in Colorado should I ever hmm. have them. But where were, uh, where were you where did you grow up though? I grew up in North Carolina, which is halfway down the uh, East Coast. Carolina, Colorado. Yeah, same thing. Just same fucking thing, right? Yeah. Wales, Spain. Right. I couldn't uh, tell you anything on a map in the UK, and you're probably the same. You know where New York and LA are, and probably Miami. Um, but that, you know. Tell me about tell me about your visit to London and how you felt, how you uh, how you interacted with the local uh, people and uh, enjoyed it. Well, I didn't see any of it, so no. we. Took... So this is this is the problem, isn't it? So the 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 fact is, you came all the way yeah. to London yeah. and you slept, as far as I can tell and you spent most of the day in one hotel room we and then shot, you went back to the airport i think you go for you went for one meal we no we went out to the same restaurant we were there for five nights we went out to the same restaurant three nights un fucking <laughs> uh apparently we weren't staying in a great side of town we were near the not yeah. Heathrow, but the other airport it's a great that's a great excuse isaac but you you just you just didn't deal with jet lag very we well it's, it's long we, short of it. we shot in the hotel we stayed in and then we went to the conference center next door and then we came back and there was a thai restaurant down the street i was in bed by eight or nine o'clock every night i was wiped out yeah because i was saying that actually i know I, I don't look i'm 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 taking the piss out of you but realistically uh when i came to la i would get the taxi to sunset phone you go to a bar like four doors down mm -hmm. get fucked up shoot then phone you again probably get more fucked up and then uh, come home so yeah i mean realistically it's exactly the same thing yeah except you went out and saw stuff and we went to bars well no well true i but only usually as part of the uh as part of the shoot and then yeah. yeah i mean we went to a couple of restaurants but yeah now do you find it it's easier for you coming here are you like amped up and then going home you hit the jet lag or are you tired when you get here and then you're rejuvenated when you get back because i was no, tired. Jet, lag, jet lag kicks the fuck out of you didn't it? I, I remember actually one time uh i think we'd been out as well it was one of those nights and got there i mean the problem is when you get there that it's i don't know whatever time late at night so i'll get there at three o'clock in the afternoon and then i'll want to drink because my body's saying you need a drink so so I'll, I'll have like a whiskey sour or something because i think i'm being you know very uh very cool and then <laughs> uh and then you know then you'll have to do like some sort of styling meeting or whatever or just try and avoid it and then you know shoot the next day but the it's the next, it's that night or the next day where like, it, you know, it comes to like eight o'clock at night and you just realize that you're slurring your words. You can't really keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. People are like looking at you as if to say, have you, are you having a stroke? Right. <laughs> like, as in, you know, you're like, and then, and then you're like, I really need to go to bed. And then, but then you wake up at 4am and you're wide awake and then, you know, and then it will happen again the next day. So it's really, but I, I remember once that, that the time I'm thinking of that, I, it was, I think it was my 30th birthday. 30 something and I got home and uh it arranged a surprise party so I got back off the plane got in and as you know I'm sure for when you got in you just want to go to fucking bed right yeah or just get into your pajamas and whatever and um 
got back and there was like all of my family, all of my friends, ta-da! <laughs> and it was like, no, no, sorry. I, I'm, I'm it's out. very nice to see you, but fuck off. Right. <laughs> yeah. So no, it's not easy. Yeah. I would just, I just, uh, when I came home from doing nothing in London, uh, I think I shot maybe 400 snaps the whole time I was there for five days. Uh, okay. Is that a lot? No. No. <laughs> Uh, the old me, when I first started photography, the old me would have taken like 10,000 and been oh, like, okay. hope one of these is good. But now it's like, snap, got it. Let's go get out of here. It's good. Do you find that? I, I find when you go to somewhere that's like a major city and I got this with, a, definitely with New York, is that you don't want to go and see like the, you know, Statue of Liberty because you've seen it like a million times. So you going and seeing it in person it's just a shit version of what you've seen on a movie. So why would you want to go and see it? Right? I mean, I, I know this is a, this might be, <laughs> this might sound like the worst thing that anybody's ever said ever, but I, I just, I just think, I just don't get that. I just don't understand why, you know, it's the experience that I quite enjoy. Like yeah. the bar that you have nobody's been to, or they're like, you know, the sort of the weird sort of conversation with someone or the argument with a taxi driver usually in New York. But mm -hmm. the, you know, like, it's not like it's sort of going and seeing the sites and right. taking pictures. I just don't get it. Right? Uh, for me, it's about like where we're going to film, like getting to shut down something I've seen on a movie before. That's pretty fun. But yeah. just like I went to the, uh, the Empire State Building last time I was in New York oh. and it caught on fire while I was there and they gave us Jesus. our money back. They gave us our $45 back. And I was like, I'm super glad you gave me my money back because that's just like being at the top of a tall building. I've been yeah, to the right. top of a tall building before. And that's another thing, is, is going higher in a city, I don't understand why that's good. I don't understand why going up and seeing more above a city is, 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 is a thing that people want to do. I don't understand. It's like, well, well you guys have can, that, yeah, uh, get it. that ski gondola that goes over the, uh, the O2 and yeah, the river. Yeah, pointless. Fucking pointless. I will. And probably quite dangerous. Uh, all I thought about was the plummet to the water, the impact that will probably break your back when you hit the water, and then freezing yeah. to death before you drowned as your capsule sinks. What a way to go. Yeah. So I time, yeah. I time lapsed it. I've been doing that thing where I've, I've started to put like funny yeah. cuts into my show now that there's video. So I tell myself when I snap, like a video comes up, and then when I snap, it's. it's I was thinking. That, I was thinking that. I was thinking that today. I was thinking, what's your like? Do you have like an intro tune, like Frasier or something? Do you love like a sort of? Do, 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 do. Yeah, I have one. It's like a '90s themed uh, okay. sitcom, and uh, I was gonna shoot me like messing with the printer, and then when the camera, when I see the camera, then I'm like, huh, and then I like smile off to the camera, and then I like fall Brilliant. and do that like 50 <laughs> times. Um, but I think that'll get old. So I think I'm going to shoot What about, what do, do you not have to have like a sort of bikini clad lady sit down and be like, oh, that would be really low, do da, 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 da. And yeah. you like smoking a cigarette off the side and stuff like that. Yeah, I think for, for the intro, it's more about like thinking I'm looking cool or thinking I'm doing something awesome until I know that I'm on camera and then, then, I, then it gets goofy. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. originally I was going to shoot that once and then play it in front of every episode. Um, <laughs> then I realized that gets boring. My intro song's a minute and a half. No, man, no, that's not true. People fucking love an intro sequence. It makes them feel relaxed. It makes them feel warm. It makes them feel like they can get their like cup of tea or beer or glass of white wine or both beer and glass of white wine and sit down and and you know just yeah. get ready for the onslaught of fantastic shit that's about to happen. Which in video, I 100% agree. But for the audio only listeners, oh, I see. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a minute and a half of basically full yeah. house. And, you know, <laughs> most, which I don't know if you had Full House in the UK. Mm. Um, I'm aware of it. We don't, but yeah. They rebooted um, it as Fuller House. They even brought it back. So um, man, I'll, lovely, I'll send you the, um, the song. It's full on a minute and a half, which should only be 30 seconds of like the cheesiest 90s sitcom, just blend, mega blend. So that's why I picked Christ. it. That sounds good. Uh, well, I, I, here's a question, because, and this might not be, podcast friendly but what is the i mean you know you're living in the uh the capital of filmmaking in the world which now can't make any film that must they must is there not rioting no no i don't i mean as in the is there any people want is everybody to, just really happy to have a day off 
people are super good about doing the socially distant thing here. Um, they just want the parks and beaches back. Like if we can't go to work, let us out of the house. Like we'll stay away right. from each other. But so many people were going to the parks and beaches that everybody else was like, well, why am I stuck in my apartment? I'm going to go out too. And then it just turned into a holiday for everybody. Yeah, so, it's the same here. They, 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 had, they, had to, they had to get pleased to at the roads because all the English people were coming here uh, to their second homes and uh, getting, you know, there was, that, then there was, there was going to be a problem. Yeah. Because you guys have a bunch of racism over there, don't you? No, not really. I, the well, only between, uh, no, as we don't have the same racism that you have, which is people of different colors. It's right. that we have, um, although we obviously do, sadly, but the, we, what we have is a sort of uh, tribal sense of, and actually what, what's hilarious uh, is that it's tribal even within, <laughs> even within the spaces of a mile. So you sort of, <laughs> you know, well, you haven't got the right, you know, you're not from that right part of Liverpool or you're not from that yeah. right part of leads or yeah london so so you know and actually to the point where there's gangs who are i don't know if you have this in la but they're postcode gangs so if you go from np7 to np1 or whatever well np is oh yeah else, but like m1 to like n3 then you'll get shot yeah we also, have I know, you won't get, sorry you won't get shot you if you get shot at worst case scenario you'll probably just get stabbed and oh. and die right. um so um uh so it's pretty full on yeah it's like you know there's there's well and, and that <laughs> is the sort of thing that we do not like seeing in the uk you don't like knives why would you carry that what do you need that for i need to open boxes and cut layout board a lot god i mean uh, are you carrying an automatic weapon as well <laughs> no i gave up all my guns when i moved here which i probably shouldn't tell people but i'm in the process of acquiring more firearms as we speak in mm. case case this whole thing gets weird i'm also beefing yeah up. I, that's so weird because i got i got a little bit like that right so i, was, I think if we've watched um uh, contagion which didn't help Why? and then uh uh well because it was number one on netflix oh, and we couldn't God. think what else to watch and uh and so i started building gates have you seen my gate building scenario no i've, I've built two gates i built well i'm on the on my third um so i've started fortifying our our uh, things so people can't get in as if we're going to get attacked by zombies or something wait by gates do you mean like get, you're putting them on the house or are you building a fence with a gate in it uh i'm building gates between we're, the house is made of stone and wood so i'm building gates in between the stone so people can't get through oh so yeah. there formerly was a gate there 15... to be fair to be fair they have a very easy sort of like just li quite quaint little sort of um thing that goes over i mean it's not hard but it just gives us a little a little bit of warning right just a little bit of like yep yeah, someone's coming in the gate mm -hmm. um and uh yeah i mean it's partly to keep my one and a half year old from jumping off various things but, yep. but it's also a, a part of me was thinking yeah it might kick off i might have to fortify this house i might have to yeah. if there's looting yeah i'm gonna have to get i'm gonna have to you know get on go on the uh underweb or whatever the fuck they call it and uh and get myself a a stun gun. I don't think I, I don't, I, I tried. Well, so, so anyway, in terms of my trips to LA, I once tried because I was so bored. We did a James Morrison video in uh, Toronto, getting through, by the way, getting from Toronto through New York was a nightmare. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to diss the customs people, but they were fucking rude. Anyway, then went to <laughs> LA um, and I'd been, and, and there had been various narcotics involved so i got to la and i and i and i was feeling a bit rubbish um and uh and i and i said to my friends i had a couple of days off which was very unique for me and i said um what do i do what can i do in la right so he said well i'll take you to a gun club i was like mm, okay um so i went to the gun club i've told you this story mm -hmm. and the guy the guy the guy in the gun club so this guy like fires guns regularly and he's like well into it i went to a gun club and that and basically just opened my mouth for like two seconds and they he just handed me i had to sign this thing saying that i hadn't smoked weed but i but i could have been drunk and high on crack or whatever but i just hadn't smoked weed thank god yeah um and uh and so i got and they, they gave me the gun that was this big Right, they gave me basically an Englishman's gun, pew, pew. a tiny, yeah. a tiny little gun, right? Yeah. And I was like, uh, "Thank you." Not really what I had in mind. Anyway, went into the the place. What I don't know, we call it the range. Yeah. And then went in. Oh fuck me! Right, it was. I, you know when you, you know when, when I hear like a hi hat, like it makes me blink. Mm -hmm. Like I, I mean, this was like that times a million. 
And the, the noise, this guy had like an elephant gun. One guy had like an elephant gun. The other guy had like a double shotgun thing like of Terminator. Mm -hmm. And they were like, boom, boom. and it was just horrific. I was like, my body was shaking. I was like a mess. And then, so I got to the thing. I, was, I had these headphones on, which did nothing. And I, it was it was traumatic enough, right? So then I'd got this gun out and he's like, right, so, you know, load the gun, take a shot. And I was like, right, I loaded it. Luckily, I turned to him with the gun in hand, which he nearly slapped me around. It's just literally actually slapped me around the face and said, please never do that. And uh, <laughs> and and then I, I said, oh, I put these in right, right? He said, well, you put them in backwards. Oh, which wow. Means, which, means you'll have, which means you'll effectively have killed yourself. Which for me was like, why are we here? And what am I doing holding a gun? Right? Well, because it's impossible to set them off if you put them in backwards. Because well, the firing pin hits he was... the head and not the igniter. It's well, I, I, My problem was, why do I mind my firing? Because on the films, you just go like that, bang, bang, boom, right? I yep. was like, like trying to try not to sweat yep. and like, <laughs> scream a little bit. Anyway, he was, um, he was like, I don't think you should be holding that. Anyway, he, he finally got it sorted. <laughs> I took a shot and I shot the room. And the uh, and the and he took he he and he took three shots just to hit the target to make me feel better. <laughs> oh, he was. Just... I, I just couldn't hit the target. I was like, I don't know what's going on. It was the most stressful forty minutes of my life. And uh, and then so then I came back through LA Customs to go to South America. I was going to Sao Paulo. It's covered in gun, whatever that is. What's that? Gun powder. Gun powder. Yeah. Red, and residual and, and the, all the things that I had all over me anyway. So it was like, you know, the, it, was, it was horrendous. So they're swabbing you and the whole thing's going off instead of... Like, yeah, exactly. Like they're swabbing me and it was like, wow, he's scoring all the points. Instead of detecting anything specific, he just says yes. <laughs> it just says, <laughs> what is going on? Do I arrest him. All of it. Yeah. 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 A anal cavity search for sure. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, that, that obviously that's, that's, that's something you enjoy. But in in uh, lieu of getting a gun, <laughs> in lieu of getting a gun, do you guys have a dog? We've got a Chihuahua called Kiki, yeah. uh, who I wouldn't classify. Uh, I don't know. She's on the borderline of that's being a, a dog. That's a she, cat that barks. She she comes and uh, shits in the uh, in my office actually, just to tell me that she hates me every now and again. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, she's. I mean, yeah, she's. It's to answer your question. Um, officially, yes. Te technically yes technically yes <laughs> any thoughts on getting a big dog to protect the house and the kids I, do, I, do, I hate dogs i absolutely hate and i know this is you know people are like oh God, what sort of man are you what sort of human being have you got a heart have you got a soul yeah i have and i really like them if someone else has got them but if i've got them i don't i don't find picking up another animal shit something i really want to do right it's not for me either until I uh... it makes me it actually makes me throw up it, like I, I, I as soon as I go near, like I can't do it so it makes me like an involuntary gag so I can't like I can't do it unless I have to then clean up dog shit and puke <laughs> <laughs> it's the twofer or nothing oh uh, so no dogs so there you go Isaac I hope this is I hope this is helpful this is riveting television right here this is gonna get picked up by NBC in no time mm, absolutely um so no guns no dogs except the the chihuahua uh but a couple of gates so if it if it cracks off you guys are pretty locking well it down Lock, we're locking it down in the most polite way possible so gun there's most english sort of guns are outlawed right but you can have a musket in the country or something not really no you can't you can't do any of that shit because um i don't know if you're aware but people tend to get killed hmm you know, uh, March. What are your What are your views on uh, on on gun ownership, Isaac? Uh, you know what? If this is the United States, so if you want one, go get one. If you don't want one, don't have one. Uh, I, know, I know. I'm fully aware of what the United States views are. <laughs> what are your views, Isaac? I'm trying to keep it uh, Switzerland <laughs> over here, so I don't alienate any viewers. But at some point, I'm going to have to develop a point of view uh, and just say, "Fuck it, I'm going to go with these people," and hopefully, they listen to the show. Um, I think, the, yeah, I, but like, honestly, like the pre, like the president. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear what he said last week? Sorry, I'm back. In, I'm back into the corner. I, 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 I mean, it just gets it gets more bizarre and it gets better from an, and obviously from our perspective. It's mad. I mean, we've got our own issues, right, with Brexit yeah. and everything else. Like, but um, nothing really computes to not, nothing on the scale of him saying that and then the. And seeing on the news that the upscale of people being admitted to 
ICU units because they've drunk various disinfectants. Um, yeah. And him going, I don't know why that would be. Right. I was being sarcastic. I don't, yeah, why would that be? Like, I think because he said it on fucking national television, idiot. I, it, 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 yeah, and and believed it. I think is the most important thing. Yeah, but yeah. Um, but what seems, else did he say? It seems like you guys have a trump I, I, of your own. It's hard though. to keep up. He, with Boris is kind of a uh, a trump of your own, though, right? He says some silly things from time to time, does he not? He, he, he he's uh, a clown. Um, of sorts, but yeah, I mean, I think I think it'd be nice when both countries, I think, get back to uh, politicians just being quite boring and getting on with their job, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, as in, yeah. just do it properly. Um, you know, like any other situation, I don't, I don't really want Krusty the Clown running my bank, so um, I would, I would move bank. Whereas you can't move country that easily, so it's tricky. But I think right. you know, it'd be great just not to have. Um, I'd rather have Lisa running it than Krusty, basically. <laughs> Nice reference. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and we haven't lined up anybody that it's going to inspire any hope either. Biden called his wife his sister the other day. So, <laughs> great. There's a running... Oh, God. What do you, I, 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 I thought, you know, I, I was a big Corbyn fan, which means that, in you know, that translates as a Bernie Sanders fan. I thought that guy was great, you know. And, I, and what happened here was that, um, you know, uh, ironically, um, the... the you know, he had all of these. Cor Corbyn, the last the last election we had, Corbyn had all of these uh, policies that he was going to implement, and everybody was like, "Oh, that's ridiculous! It's fucking ridiculous! There's not enough money! What a twat!" And then the COVID nineteen happened, and all of those policies, all of that money came out of nowhere. All of those policies got implemented effectively, and and it was like blank check. Just let's go for it. And and you know, and nobody here, which is just ironic turns around and goes, yeah, but that guy was sort of saying that like six months ago, right? Right. And we were all calling him a dickhead. So I, I just, I find, you know, same with Bernie Sanders, really, this idea of that they're pariahs because they're socialists. I just think, well, aren't we all socialists in well, a way? I the mean, problem with... Because otherwise the world ends in in tears of, of, of burning fire and everybody sort of like dying. Well, the problem is, is that I, I already currently live in a socialistic <laughs> state because we talk share politics. talk like tax money to build roads and schools. Right. So that's a socialistic policy. But in our education system, they teach us about socialism right after they teach us about Nazis. So inherently, the, wow, they're like, oh, I'm going to assimilate Nazis and socialism. It because, must because, be bad. Because, not, because socialism is linked with Marxism and, 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 uh, and, and the Russian sort of uh, right. communist uh, ideal. Yeah. And that, and that, I mean, you know, I can sort of see the lineage of that, but I mean, God fucking hell, man. It's just, and that's just mad, isn't it? it it's and then, totally I mean, mad. you and know, then, why would they not teach you about like Norway? And then the, like, split, the same people that are <laughs> incredibly scared of socialism are asking where their stimulus check is from the government. And then they yeah. want to know where their unemployment is. And yeah. it's like, hey, just remember, there's two things the problem with that. One, you're asking for help from the government, which is fine. Everybody needs it. Nobody's working. I totally get it. I got a stimulus check. I'm on an unemployment right now as well. Uh, just remember, we're going to have to pay that money back. It's not like we have a surplus. In fact, everybody over here is aware that we have a national debt. And the last time I checked, I should look it up. It's 17, 19, 18, 27 trillion dollar national debt. Right. Yeah, but but and and the point of that is that that number is a concept. Mm -hmm. So so the the idea that that number is just a concept. It's it's a number that sounds a lot because they've told you it's a lot. Here we had austerity. So for so, so since the financial crash, there's been this idea of austerity. So everything costs more. Uh, there was a reduce a reduction of services, the reduction of social care, reduction of the NHS, everything else. You know, all of this stuff that we felt the absolute fucking kick in the arsehole, I promise you, mm -hmm. it's been misery for, you know, for most, it's been, it's been felt. And then they open the fucking doors. As soon as COVID comes in, they open the doors and go, oh, yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, fuck that. Because it's a fucking concept. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, I mean, God, you know, we could go on about this for a long time, but the, it, it's frustrating that... Um, it is frustrating that you know people are dying because of those decisions, and 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 people are dying. You know, this, it, what, what I think what this crisis has done really well is is highlight that it is not I, it is we. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
um, there and there's a lot of interesting like counter arguments to the lockdown. I mean, I can I can kind of see it where everybody's coming from because the amount of uh, car accident deaths has been greatly reduced because no one's driving because everybody's locked down. So like at mm. what point I was explaining it in the terms of like uh, the insurance adjuster from Fight Club, right? He's got to go through and do the math on how much each life is worth. And at a certain yeah. point, we have to do that same math. And it's unfortunate. And people are that we're going to accept a number of deaths to restart the economy. Yeah. But the I think I was listening to that uh, doesn't matter. But at a certain point, the worldwide starvation hunger numbers are going to go up from the economic collapse. That's going to far vastly outweigh the number of deaths that we're going to get from COVID. So the number of economic processes that. Well, sorry, just to stop you, unless you unless there is a readjustment like there was in 2008 about the economic collapse. So 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 you can readjust because it uh, again it is a concept. Mm -hmm. So you can readjust like they did. So the banks didn't, nothing went actually went under, they just got bailed out. So you can, there is a readjustment that can happen, which is a conceptual readjustment, which can, which can happen, which actually means that that doesn't necessarily have to happen. Right. Yeah, there will, of course, they'll, they'll, they'll be governments saying, well, you know, we've got to spend less here because of what happened with COVID and God, fuck me, that's going to be an absolute tidal wave of shit. Mm -hmm. Um, because they bailed us out while we were dying of COVID. I mean, it, the whole thing's fucked up, man. So the whole thing's, without getting into, I don't think I'm a conspiracy theorist, I'm just a fucking realist. I, you know, the, the reality is that, you know, it, it depends on who's telling the story. Mm -hmm. It depends on who's who you're talking to um, in terms of how it's being dealt with um, and, what, and what, you know, um, yes, big businesses will lose money. Okay. Can they take it? Probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, can can people who haven't got any money take it? No, right. Well, you know, so it's a rebalance. You know, uh, maybe that's maybe that's that and that again. Let's go back to socialism. That's sort of what socialism is. Well, speaking of conspiracy theories, <laughs> sorry, it got deep then. Didn't it? No, no, no. It got annoying. Are you aware of the comet that's currently hurtling towards Earth right now? That's breaking up. Yeah, I am, and I and I said to my wife, I want, I hope it just clips your ex husband's house. <laughs> I, uh, 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 that's funny. It might not hit tonight. It is. It's going to hit the 29th or 30th. Today is the 29th. Um, I plan on driving out to the desert tomorrow night to see it from a dark place. What to see the end of the world? Yeah. Why is not? it going to hit? Is it going to? Is this what? What's the vibe? Is it going to hit? Well, if you're a conspiracy theorist, they've kept us all inside and pacified. So that when it hits, there aren't as many people outside running around. Oh, is that what this is? I, I, the, um, uh, to be fair, we've had locusts, we've had uh, floods, we've had um, hurricanes and shit. We've had like um, I haven't seen the four horsemen in the apocalypse, but I'm sure that they've you know they've ridden through. Mm -hmm. So it's only a matter of time before we uh, before it, the, the big day comes. And um, uh, will that mean that dinosaurs then come back to the earth? It depends. That would be cool. If we're going strictly biblical rules here, I can walk you down this path. Uh, there's a qu quite a few number of things that have to happen before the actual apocalypse ha happens. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we we have to at some point um, identify the the. Uh, there's a couple of things that have to happen. If you're going, there's two there's two schools of rules. I'm going to go with the New Testament, the Christianity side, as opposed to like the Jewish side who doesn't believe in the, in the New Testament, but. Um, there has to be a, a set of circumstances that trigger the, the rapture, which is where Christians all get uh, beef, beamed up automatically to heaven. And then after the rapture. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Isaac. Can I just stop you for a second? Do you mind if I go and get another glass of wine before I hear this yeah. uh, fantastic? Uh, uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, do, you, do you mind? No. Go I, know, ahead. I know we're on your time here, but the. Uh, I, got, do, do you I mind? got all day. I got all day. All right, wicked. All yeah, right. Good. I see I've got a box of wine. So, uh, you know, just didn't it, drink. It sounded like you stepped off camera, pissed in your cup. It does, doesn't it, right? So well, that's what it sounds like. Right? Down. It's a box. It's a little bit like that. And it will, yeah, anyway. Sorry. So. Um, I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying to get some uh, structural backup. It's been a long time since I've sat through. Uh, the New Testament. The, the whole church thing. <laughs> um <laughs> But, it's been a while since I've sat through the New Testament, to be fair. But yeah. so go on. So there's going to be a few things that happen before six, the Judgment Day. Six, in fact. Six biblical signs of the end of times, right? It starts with Christ's second coming, which is the rapture. All Christians get 
beamed up, Scotty, right? And then this says nation against nation. I don't know what that means. And then false- as far as I, sorry, just to say, which as far as I can tell, hasn't happened. No, I would I would no. hope to be yes. okay. considered. If not me, my mom. I doubt. I, doubt, I, doubt, I seriously doubt you would be on that list. I'm sorry, Isaac. Okay. I, I, well, my mom okay. would definitely, and some preachers that I know would be gone by now. I think. Maybe. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But you're not. You're no, not I, I get stuck behind. But I have a, <laughs> I have a second chance, right? So after okay. that, um, you will then have the uh, opportunity to either uh, take or not take the mark of the beast, which is where everybody's getting super excited now about uh, these tracking programs where you get an app on your phone that says whether or not you have COVID or not, because that's the start to getting chipped or getting barcoded. So it's not getting 666 tattooed on your uh, testicles, because I had that done and it was very painful. Is that not right? Well, the funny thing about 666, if you really want to go super deep on this, and someone's going to have to fact check me, but that on the barcode, the first, middle, and last longest bars of every single barcode is the number six well, what's that mean it means that if you get any barcode stamped on you at all you have 666 on you so okay. uh that could also that not be true, true. <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. anyway uh, yeah so anyway i'm talking so, i'm um, talking like an expert on the end of times i just sat through a bunch of it when i was a kid and i'm just trying to back it up with a little i bit love it I, I love it i can't wait i mean it's partly because it, i mean it's like you know the end of an episode of like you know it's like the end of the season isn't it you're like really it's really exciting yeah. so i sort of in some ways i sort of hope i live through it not for my kids sake obviously but yeah. for the for my sake if we're going to go out wow what a way to go out right what is wouldn't it be cool if we were here for the end like if we yeah. got to see the season finale of life absolutely like the fires of you know everything on fire and people like running around screaming and everybody's shagging each other it's gonna be great the yeah. what um so anyway carry on you i think you're at two. Oh yeah i uh i'm gonna cut this one off because i know i'm gonna piss a lot of people off uh oh god jesus christ really yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the wrong website to be looking at. Uh, I need to brush up on my um, uh, end of time. Did you, did you Google stuff. end of time? Yeah, Scott. but I was having I was having a discussion yesterday with someone who who was saying that uh, this is a biblical punishment uh, from a higher source, uh, and I had the counter argument: if we're going just strictly old school, old Old Testament, there was always a warning, and then a result if you don't change yeah. your behavior then i will send these plagues do you not think we've had a few warnings well that as was... in do you not think i mean it's one of those things where you think have you not got the message yet guys because there's been quite a lot of warnings and i'm not quite sure we're fully getting it 100 percent. well was the warning last week was the warning a year ago was the warning 25 years ago was, was it that was it that uh, the whole of australia was on fire and that all of its animals pretty much burned or was it that the flooding generally was a nightmare. Or was it just the locust vibe? I mean, the locust thing, that was, I imagine that was God saying, I literally wrote it in a book that locusts would come. They haven't come before in, you know, as far as I can tell. Here's a load of locusts. Did that happen to you? Do you, what, what, do you want, what do you want me to do? No, but what no. But what do you want me to do? <laughs> do you want me to write it, literally? <laughs> I mean, do you want to put it in this? I mean, they, they need to get one of those planes, you know, that like, puts the light. Like, that has the thing off the back going. Yeah, Skywriters. The end of the world. Yeah, yeah, the end of the world is coming, and then people will be like, "Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not going to happen." But he's just put it on a plane. Well, I I don't know. Last last time we had it written, literally written in stone, the Ten Commandments. So and then I don't think that's going to fly anymore, though, is it? No, because people are going to be like, "You made hasn't that. got the reach." Right. And then uh, we had uh, Moses with his direct delivery to Pharaoh. <laughs> Um, but since then, we, then we had Jesus and so we talk about the big book of lies because I, I, uh, since as as we're on this uh, topic, which I know that you can't use in your podcast. Um, do you believe in God? Yeah. hundred percent. Do you? It's, it's, oh. it's morphed over the years, right? So I grew up going to a, a private Christian school, going to church Sundays, uh, and twice on, twice on Sundays and Wednesday night. Right. So I got a lot of church growing up. Uh, so then the first thing I did as a young adult was to go that tends to put people off normally, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, That's on. the first thing it did was to put me off on a journey in the other direction. Let's go find out about sex, drugs, and rock and roll still on that path. But they, they're, uh, there's a parable in the Bible that says train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he won't stray from it. So I find myself like being drawn back to my biblical upbringing when I was a kid but not so much in the way that was 
beat into my brain. Like I'm, I'm about a higher power. I'm all about like the, the Jesus story still kind of makes sense. And scientifically, I think there's some proof to back it up, but, uh, am I sitting in the pews every Sunday? No. Um, I've got, I, I, I think it's interesting because I've got, um, uh, a strange relationship with the whole thing. I was very cynical up until about five years ago. And then, and I was actually, my cousin sort of found God and there was, and we used to go out and just rip it up together. And I was a bit like, and one day he turned around and went, oh, I found God. And I was like, oh man, come on. And the, and the, you know, like Jesus, what? And, and it was one of those things where, and it actually sort of sowed a seed a little bit. And then we moved here and we didn't know anybody. And it was one of those things where it's like, well, where are we going to go that sort of gets us into a situation where we meet some people? So we went to church and I just really enjoy, I've always enjoyed, like whether it's Sacre Coeur in France or whether it's the local church. Uh, I've just really enjoyed being in churches because they're really calm. It feels like that the world switches off, you know? Mm. And, um, which is, you know, from an anxiety perspective, it's quite nice. Um, and actually the, the local vicar, as we call them, a priest, I think, as you do, um, you know, he was actually quite cool. He was about sort of our age and my age. And uh, and he was telling this story and it started, it was quite funny, it started with like a um, story about, uh, he, was da- he was dating this, he started dating, he started dating this girl. And you could see like the front row of old people like having some sort of like <laughs> seizure going, yeah. Jesus Christ, where this is going. Yeah. And, and it turned into a parable about like how the great vine in the house turned into something lovely. But the um but the 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 point of it was that um it sort of made you sort of readdress the idea of what God is and and, and all that stuff. And I sort of um I quite liked it. Anyway, to cut long story short, we bought um my wife's uh, grandma is quite old and uh, and her husband died a couple of years ago when we met actually just before we met um, and this year we bought a cushion on Amazon with his face on um, and it and we didn't do, we didn't plan this but just because of the delivery times it turned up on his birthday oh wow and uh, which was today um, and as, you, as, as happens with things that you buy online, it's absolutely massive and it's got his face on it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you saw the picture, it's like this big. Yeah. But the, um, and I just, it made you, makes you think, doesn't it? That yeah. that's a bit weird. And, and, and uh, you know, if that's all religion is really, is that things happen that they, they, you don't plan them, but they're a bit weird, that, that they happen a bit, not, a bit more than you would normally think. Um, then I quite like it. But if the religion, religion is based on judgment, then it can fuck off. Right, exactly. If the if the worst thing that happens about going to a communal space every Sunday and having a community of people that are there to help you out if you need anything or that you're willing to help out if should they ever get in any trouble and having a sense of community, if that's the worst thing that comes out of religion, I'm all for it. Yeah. But uh, the stigmas and the voting and the left, right and all that other stuff and like, you're going to go to hell. If the war, the, well, the wars, the, the crusades, the, right. um, right. A little before my time, but, uh, yeah, I heard about that. Right. Well, before, it's not before mine. I'm a bit older than you, but by 500 years, <laughs> <laughs> what are you, a vampire. Uh, but I, I think the universe is just absolutely too vast for us to be alone. And I think we're not the only ones trying to get it right. So I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens after this existence is over. And whether or not it's a simulation like Elon Musk thinks it is. Uh, I, I, Elon Musk today said free America, didn't he? And, um, and in my mind, Elon Musk can go fuck himself, to be honest. But it's, the, it's um, hot and cold for me. I, some days he's a genius, and the other days it's like, why are you shipping? Well, I mean, he's, he's great, but I don't know why he's commenting on how America should run. I mean, it's like, you know, anyway. Yeah. But the, the, the sort of... It's not, it's, it's, it's go make some fucking cars or like build a giant, you know, catapult or whatever the fuck it is you're doing today. But like, don't like, you know. Right. Just, or build us, build us a ship that do, gets us off this planet when the rock hits. Yeah. Do that, man. That's great. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah. I, 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 you know, it leads on to a conversation, I think, about, about, you know, I, about the other world. And I think that the sort of, you know, it, it sort of links together in my mind in that, you know, Wales actually is a place um, 
and stop me, by the way, Isaac, if this is boring. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop the, you in about 13 but, minutes, to be honest with you, because i got to go at 2.30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think Wales is quite a mystical place, and it's sort of, you know, this, it's, it's Celtic and, and, um, and very, 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 very old. And, and you get that feeling when you're here that there's sort of, there's, a, you know, going back to the Druids and all that sort of stuff and, and the idea of a religion before religion, so a religion before something that was prescribed, something that was told, something that was um, administered or, or, or uh, what's the word, um, forced. Mm -hmm. so, so exactly what you're talking about, that all of that good shit, but none of the judgment and the bad shit. And, um, and so part of the reason for being here and part of the reason for enjoying being here is, is sort of connecting with that a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds a bit, you know, I don't want to get into a sort of hippie scenario because it, it it lessens it because I don't think it is that. I think it's really exciting and um, and I think that uh, you know there was a there was a thing the other day where we just went out and and just respected the idea that the seasons were changing. Mm -hmm. uh, sat in the country and and just um, just shut the fuck up. Right. And it was uh, humbling and brilliant and lovely and maybe that's quite a good end. Well. well, I have one follow-up question to that because you're two things that I'm not. You're a husband and a father. So when you first became a father or first became and a, a great husband, lover, third thing and a great lover. Well, uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, we, we may share some skills. I don't know. Hope we never find out. Uh, do I, yeah. uh, or maybe we do find out. Who knows? Free love. Well, uh, I, think, I think you're forgetting that night in, uh, in the sunset. Um, what's it called? The uh, standard. Yeah, well, I will never forget that. <laughs> Uh, and it, I think it was the Beverly Hilton. Anyway, um, when you first became a father first, I mean, I, I, um, I'll let you answer this in any order that you want to, but did that change your, let's just call it your cosmic view? Like how, how did life change the first time you saw your first kid? Well, I, you know what it changed? It changed this idea. It changed the idea and it goes back to the conversation we were having earlier. It changes you from being me to uh us and and it changes the idea that you know i, I used to be, and it's a longer conversation but i used to be I used to get very depressed and used to be um at points uh suicidal and uh you know very briefly not not something that i would uh that i didn't act upon but i i, I was really you know really focused on on my own self had a kid and that takes that out the window. It, it just throws it out the window. It, it makes it sort of like, well, for me, it made it very much like, well, you know, stop doing that. You know, stop that think thought process. Don't, don't, you know, you, it's not really about you now. It's not about what you want. It's about what, you know, it's about providing. It's about protecting. It's about giving. It's about um, all those things. And, I, I, you know, I remember actually when I had, and weirdly, when I had my second child, that um, I thought, well, how much, you know, how can I, I, I love, I love one, the, my first child so much, how can I have room to love my second? And actually what happened was that your heart just doubles and that you have even more love. So now I, and now I've had my third, it triples. And so, you know, I'll cry at any given moment, <laughs> whether it's a Pixar moment where, you know, and any well, throughout Pixar movies, but throughout you know even at sort of um, you don't have them here, but DIY SOS or any of those daytime shows that you you know as soon as there's the end bit and everybody hugs, I'm a, I'm in bits, yeah. and the, and the, and it's sort of you know the the idea of connecting with yourself and humanity and what you're here for and the fact that it's not about just you and all that sort of stuff you know um, home family. Uh, all those important things is is you know um, is probably relevant now more than ever you know um, and uh, you know so uh, yeah I, I think that's what it does I, I sort of you know is, is it a nightmare yeah is it a pain in the ass yeah of course it is uh, has it ruined my social life yeah but then you know um, in the same way you know look I love you and I and thank you for having me. Well, and uh, I love you too, you know, it's, a nice, it's a nice moment to, uh, you know, end this conversation, really, because I think that, you know, it is, um, it's about us, isn't it? About people and whatever you're doing, whatever you, successes you've had or anything else, it doesn't really matter because 
frankly, you know, it's about about you and me, about us, about but what we're doing. It's about the connections that we build and the relationships that we have while we're here. Absolutely. And then we'll figure out the rest when we get there. Yeah, and I've had four glasses of wine, so. Awesome. Well, with on that note, <laughs> uh, it's probably it's probably time for uh, a cigarette. Absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. I'll, 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 uh, we'll go outside uh, together in unity, but divided in actuality. Right. I'll just, uh, I've quit on, <laughs> so I'll Good. rub my pack. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. Quit. I'm quitting. I've been quitting for 25 years. Um, but on that note, Ross, thank you so much for uh, educating us on how to become a music video director and commissioner and uh, sharing your insights on uh, religion and fatherhood. And uh, hopefully you'll come back on. And I hope to see you in person before I see you back on the internet. I hope so. Thanks for having me. Awesome. We'll see you soon. Love you. Love you too, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. This show's a piece of shit.